why don't we get started? Uh, welcome to this afternoon's lecture by John Meyer, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Stanford. Um, his lecture will be on the social impact of a changing world society, uh, 1950 to 19, uh, 2024, and it's sponsored by the Center for the Study of Economy and Society, which I'm the director of. And the lecture follows a earlier symposium this month on uh, reforming and remaking yeah. the can you hear me? Yes. Uh, remaking the university and economy in China. And it's very clear that the Chin Chinese are remaking their universities in the model of the American Research University at a tremendously fast clip. Uh, J John Hopcroft, who spoke on the reform, uh, said that for the last 20 years, the Chinese have been opening a campus the scale of Cornell University every month, which mm -hmm. is an extraordinary thing to imagine. And it, they're it, trying to build a liberal research university in the American model. They also are make, remaking their economy. And it's very clear that of all the major economies of the world, uh, the Chinese economy now comes closest to resembling the contours of the American economy. And so clearly the liberal idea that we have pursued has had an impact in the world. And uh, John Meyer will speak on this today. I've asked David Strang to be the person to introduce John Meyer since he was a stu student and longtime colleague of John over many decades. David? Thanks, Victor. And yeah, I'm happy to represent what's really an enormous uh, collection of, of graduate students who uh, worked with and worked and learned from John over many years. I don't know if I'm, I, I think of myself as, the, as the, either the late early or early middle, but he would really have a much better sense than I. And I, I did want to share one um, sort of memory because uh, John and I, of course, go back many years. I think I first met in 1983 or 84. So really unimaginable that 40 years later, uh, uh, of course, we didn't imagine Zoom at that time, but to be introducing him, to see that he he looks fundamentally unchanged, I would say. I, I uh, grayer, uh, more withered. Um, but but uh, uh, when, I, when I think back um, to many uh, uh, great experiences with John, what I particularly remember is a period uh, when I was uh, preparing for a, a qualifying exam in uh, political sociology, I think John and Ann Swidler were the two examiners. Curiously, Ann is giving a talk in in the department here at, at Cornell uh, tomorrow. Um, but I would go into I, I was reading I'd read I read really uh, uh, deeply more deeply than I think I've ever uh, read. Uh, but I would go in to to talk with John and. I remember uh, I would come out of the meetings not having the faintest idea what we talked about, uh, and and uh, and that went on for for a month or so, or more. Uh, eventually, I could follow for uh, five or ten minutes, and then John would lose me. Um, but by the end of the semester, I I felt I could carry on a whole conversation and understand it, and even remember it later on. And so I'm feeling very optimistic about today. Uh, 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 but jo and John, uh, I, I don't need to really introduce has had a formative effect on uh, on sociology in, uh, in 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 many many ways. I can't imagine what the sociology of organizations would look like without his uh, ideas, and similarly uh, a powerful effect on uh, uh, sociology of education, on the emergence and evolution of the nation state, and uh, 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 very much uh, uh, and uh, continuing on on the on world society, and so look forward to what John has to say today, and to hopefully getting it straight. And so the John said he would like to present his lecture as in a 
concise manner, 40 minutes. And he, in, in the interest of a discussion, of Q and A, and I'll be there to monitor the discussion. Great. John, your floor. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. I wish I were there in person, but uh, so it goes now. I appreciate the invitation and the interest that you show. Uh, uh, I'm reporting on, I've been thinking about these issues and over an overview of world society thinking in conjunction with Evan Schofer at the University of California at Irvine. And we probably are trying to write uh, a long essay uh, on the matter. My theme is to describe the line of work uh, over the last decades uh, on work, sociological work on world society. Uh, and of course, I, in talking about that, you, it, there's a reciprocal relation with change in world society uh, itself over, over the decades. So those two themes are intertwined. Uh, I'll describe a, a long evolution and then the striking recent, uh, the last 10 or 12 years, uh, a shift in, uh, in direction. Uh, world society thinking uh, that I'm going to be talking about arises along with other families of thought after World War II as the intellectual world confronted what we now call globalization, meaning massive increases in global interdependence and uh, theories of how that might work, partly normative, uh, partly cognitive. Um, there are you know, several lines of thought in economics, range in different uh, political orientations, uh, in, in, uh, resurgence of the field of international relations in political science, again, with uh, you know, in different tones, and also, of course, in sociology, most prominently the world system story. Uh, all of these have a lot in common uh, because they have different uh, underlying uh, metaphysics, they tend to be presented as in conflict with each other, which is unfortunate uh, because uh, they are not uh, uh, in real opposition. Uh, and, uh, and also because... Uh, uh, some of the most interesting effects are interaction effects among them. So that uh, in a quite striking paper uh, done at Cornell by Lee and Strang, uh, there's the, the notion that yes, there are network effects in a neighborhood, but you copy your neighbor when he does good things, not when he does bad things. And what's a good or bad thing is uh, substantially structured in a wider context. Uh, a simple kind of uh, idea uh, linking more realist network pictures of, of public policy, in this case, uh, decentralization. Uh, so that's an example. Uh, world society theory. Uh, the sources of world society thinking in sociology, this, this line of thought we're talking about today, uh, there are two very simple sources. One is empirical. Uh, after World War II, as part of the globalization process, there are just massive expansions of data. Kinds of data uh, were rare uh, in, in the 1950s. Uh, I was a master's student at the University of Colorado, uh, and in a seminar, the professor, Professor Rose, showed up with a, a UN yearbook with data in it. He didn't know about it before. We had never heard of it. Uh, and he said, what can you do with it? And so we set to work. And the answer is, we couldn't do anything with it. Uh, uh, and uh, the field was like that, too. There was uh, the mishandling of that. As with any new method or data system in social science, the initial waves of work on it uh, don't work. Uh, people don't know how to do it right. So it took a, one or two decades. But by the 70s, there was a real uh, uh, ex massive amount of data. And now it's overwhelming. Uh, 
organized around up on the world level, regional levels, country levels, and so on. It wasn't there then, it is now, uh, and has been. The findings, uh, when people got it, figured out how to do it right, were not very interesting. They were what you, what you would now expect. A lot of variables associated with uh, modernization and development are in fact highly correlated with modernization and development. Uh, so a lot of that was confirming standard ways of talk and were kind of on, uh, not very interesting. The interesting thing that came out of the research uh, in the 70s was that all those causal factors that had generated the uh, uh, differences in world society between the have and the have nots and so on. All those causal forces uh, no longer operated in the post-war period so much. So yes, some countries have much more uh, you know, health, health supports than others, but the increase in uh, say hospitalization, hospital beds, or in education, or anything like that, that isn't stratified anymore, as if there is a common, uh, something going on in common in the whole world. That left open a lot of possible theories of what that might be. Uh, but you couldn't very well ignore the world since the changes were going on at a world level. That's one source of from which world society thinking took up. The second source was more and more theoretical. I mean, it was the rise of what we now call uh, neo-institutional thinking, you know, in the field of organizations. Uh, uh, famously, DiMaggio and Powell, uh, but also uh, Meyer and Rowan and uh, other people. Uh, and the idea that organizations are not just functioning in a world, they are constituted by that world. Uh, they are not competing only, they are competing, but not only competing. They are uh, under uh, culturally structured and organizationally structured isomorphic pressures. Uh, well, if that's true of organizations, maybe it's true of states also, uh, nation states, that they also swim in a, in an ether of global reality and uh, an organization of global structures, power structures, explicit organizations, and so on. Those two sources uh, were, the, were the foundation of the, this line of thought we're talking about today, the sociological thinking about uh, world society. Uh, uh, Later, uh, early on, there was there were simply empirical demonstrations of isomorphic change, and uh, the inference was that there were causal structures making that happen, but there were no, no data. Later, people started researchers started to put in data. So the conventional study uh, from nineteen seventy to twenty ten or so. Uh, might have studied a dependent variable of interest, say uh, uh, the enrollment of female students in electrical engineering uh, as a property of countries. And you would put in a, as a, as control variables of all the standard sorts, but also crucially, the rise of world discourse and organization focused on that. It became a thing people talked about. It wasn't in 1950s. Uh, uh, came up slightly in the, next, in the subsequent years, but of course now is a, a conventional subject of discourse. And it, uh, the, the, the coming American sociological meetings, there will be papers on that. And they will call it the STEM field paper, topic. Uh, well, the rise of that topic can be seen in longitudinal analyses as directly affecting so there's a world affecting what goes on a worldwide basis, rich countries, poor countries, all kinds of countries. The other crucial variable they put in, there are different measures of, 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 of how uh, STEMness is organized at the world level and, and why. 
of coming to y. The other variable uh, you'd put in would be the, the country's linkages to that world order, discursive linkages, organizational linkages. The conventional variable was, uh, was the logarithm of um, membership in, memberships in international non-governmental organizations, just as a proxy for, for uh, uh, the country's linkage. And both of those variables would, in many, a great many analyses, have uh, the expected positive effects. Uh, as time went on, uh, that those questions are shifted a little bit and became questions, well, where do all these forces come from uh, and how are they organized? And there was an increasing realization that all this, these pressures were organized around what uh, have come to be called uh, liberal models uh, of, of a world society. In other words, the kinds of things that flow and the kinds of variables in which all these changes, uh, on which all these changes follow, uh, uh, conform to a, a pattern. Uh, we had always understood and that, that in effect what we were studying was a kind of binge in world history. And but now uh, increasingly over time, we had to analyze that. And the phrase uh, liberal world order became uh, commonly used to using the word liberal in the old sense, not uh, not in the uh, uh, politicized sense. Well, where did that come from? Obviously, it, it, the cue is that everything starts in 1950. Uh, all the changes in trajectory of all kinds of variables. Uh, 1945, 1950, and then obviously at the end of World War II, uh, a lot of things happen. It's hard to disentangle. One thing is the stigmatization of all the traditional European st social structures, corporatist, statist arrangements, didn't look good in 1945. And where Europe had essentially failed and collapsed. The rise of the United States is an accidental matter, a, a radically liberal country, and in that old sense of the word liberalism. Uh, and I guess the United States had 40 some percent of the world GDP, but more to the point, it had a, a enormous amount of credibility compared to the European models. Another factor, obviously, was the rise of, of uh, the Cold War rise, the oppositional rise there, creating a, an aggressive commitment to liberalism. And you saw that even in, during World War II when you had Roosevelt representing a, a racist political system and Churchill representing an empire gathering together and celebrating the four freedoms, um, which eventually destroyed the British Empire and probably played a big role in undercutting American racism. Uh, in any case, that picture of people assembling after World War II and uh, as they had after World War I, but unsuccessfully then, tried to be more successful in, in, in creating the brave new world of liberal institutions. John Ruggie uses the word uh, embedded liberalism to describe that period because while well, there was a, lib a liberal assembly of nation states in the world, a weekly liberal one, uh, the expectations were that each of the participants, there were strong standards of what it meant to be a modern developed society in, which, uh, uh, in a proper way. Uh, so it was an embedded liberalism in the sense that, that liberal societies were imagined as embedded in uh, a somewhat liberal world. Uh, that, as John Ruggie writes about, of course, that in 1990 with the breakdown of communism, that turned into kind of uh, neoliberal triumphalism with an explicit globalization of the whole enterprise, where he imagined humans in a world society, not just a sit not citizens in a national society. Uh, he, he imagined world markets 
uh, not just national markets in a loosely pro-trade world order and so on. So Ruggie makes a distinction, I think quite reasonably, between the, the long liberal uh, period and uh, the subsequent neoliberal one, with, which uh, didn't too much change what world society researchers did, but uh, called, a, called attention to the long 50 years of construction of an imagined and partly real world society. Uh, that society as they imagined it and it's starting to create the variables that world society scholars study. Uh, it had, it rested on, I, I think, three underpinnings. All of them, as all liberalisms rest on an illiberal assumptions, of course. Uh, and this one rested on uh, three uh, pillars that directly derive from uh, Western uh, religious traditions. Uh, the first of these pillars um, uh, the celebration of the expanded individual person, partly replacing a charismatic national state. And after neoliberalism almost completely replacing in the imagination uh, the charisma of the nation state. Uh, so rights became human rights. Uh, and in this period, uh, social theory, of course, going along with all this, then reconstruct, reconstructs itself away from traditional institutionalisms, what are now called the old institutionalism, uh, around uh, an aggressive new institutionalism, that is institutions that empower and create actors, individual actors, organizational actors, nation state actors, the reconception of the world uh, in this fashion. Now I want to show you a few slides. So uh, if, uh, am I empowered to do this? Yes. Okay. Let me see what I can find here. Here we go. Uh, and uh, I'm going to share the screen. Can you see the screen here? Yes. Okay, now how do I get, well, here I can just uh, just start the slideshow. Pardon? You should start the slideshow. Got it. Thank you. I forgot how to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I've done that. It still doesn't get rid of the. Okay, here I go. No, I got it. Yeah. So the first slide I just wanted to show you is. Uh, Hoki Huang's, one of his slides, he, he's a professor uh, in Sydney, Australia. And he likes to show the rise of the word actor. These are three journal or four journals he's got, AJS, APSR, and Academy of Management Review. And, you know, starting after 1950, we start to call them actors which is a, sort of a promotion, a social promotion compared to when the, the old days when they were peasants and tribesmen and then T.H. Marshall said they were uh, citizens and civic. But then they were in the 19th century uh, 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 political citizen persons. Uh, well, now they're actors. And if you want to publish a paper, it, it sounds more scientific to call them actors and to call them people or individuals. I went through a book of 20 chapters on micro foundations of institutional theory and counted the use of the words. And they, none of the papers referred to tribesmen or even though one of the characters in one of the papers were there were Sherpas in, in Nepal, but they were not tribesmen, they were proto-union organizers. They were 
are described in modern terms. Uh, but by the uh, but the, the word actor took over. Uh, and I guess everybody uh, listening to knows that if you want to publish a paper, you should call them actors, not people or, or, or even better than individuals. Yeah, it, it, actor implies more rationality and purpose. Well, uh, the, the explosion of this expanded and promoted quality of the person uh, produced ex extreme emphases on human rights of various types. Not citizen rights anymore, but increasingly human rights. Uh, in an extraordinary dissertation at uh, Emory, Michael Elliott, who's now at Towson State, I think, in Baltimore, um, counted them. The, the ones that put human rights in, uh, uh, in some sort of international instrument. And you see that, I mean, the chart, it explodes. It's continued into the present period, but he, he has not followed up. His, his data ended in like 2000, but it, it, they go up. Furthermore, uh, the, the recognition that all kinds of people have these rights. Here, here's a, here's a li list that he finds. Oh, and a lot of them just uh, blanket ev everyone, but some of them focus on particular groups. But it's almost never group rights, he notes. They are the rights of individuals with this property, handicapped individuals, not handicapped people as a corporate group. The only exception there are, in some cases, indigenous people are seen in treaties as having uh, corporate rights. But by and large, it's an assertion of, 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 of individualism. He also... Uh, tracks who is encountered, who's entitled to pursue these because a huge change in the, uh, the, the notion of human rights was that they're not citizen rights protected by the state or created by the state. They are, are universal, they're global. So for example, with education, after the neoliberal period in the late 1990s, you had the education for all movement and everybody signed on. And that's not education for citizens, that's education for all young humans. Uh, and it, it, it's a quite striking assertion of a global modernity made up of schooled individuals. And they're uh, schooled as a matter of rights, but also in practice, school is a matter of uh, uh, membership in the world collective. So that uh, any, a child anywhere in the world without due process of law can be re required to be re-socialized in a state-sponsored prison. Uh, it's very striking. And if they want to be real actors, and they have to get some more advanced education and they have to spend uh, long years in a minimum security operation like Cornell. Uh, see, it's, it's an amazing thing. But they're empowered to pursue it. Huge uh, effect, and you see the cutting point in 1950, uh, uh, the world expansion of education. So that now uh, it's, gone, it's gone on since 2005, 40% uh, uh, or so of the world's uh, children experience post-secondary education in some way. And secondary education is becoming universal. Primary education is... And, uh, in all these cases, the the, uh, the fact that it's not 100% is treated as a social problem now. So nobody in 1950 would have thought it's a social problem if half the world's children don't go to school. Maybe it'd be a good thing if they did. But now it's an urgent uh, social problem. So uh, uh, just continuing on the uh, expand of the individual, uh, 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 you have this expansion from, from civil to political to economic and social, and in the 21st century, uh, psychic rights. So I assume at Cornell, you have people sitting in now and expressing their demands on the world political system in a, uh, an empowered role, but also they now experience stress when they take exams. 
So this is the University of Utah. And we organize all kinds of things, including therapy dogs. I don't know, does Cornell have a therapy dog system for people who are anxious about exams? In other words, we have the, the assertion of psychic rights, empowered people, and the stresses they experience are an injustice. It should be corrected by various kinds of uh, uh, socio-emotional support. Uh, so that's the individual. I could go on. Uh, enrollments, another variable is the percent of democracies. Uh, and that little reversal, and it takes off in 1950, of course, uh, and it's percent, it's not number. Um, and you notice that that slight de de curve declining, uh, and that is uh, what we talk about next, which is the post-liberal world. But before we do that, I have to talk about other uh, tent poles. One tent pole of the global liberal society is the imagined individual and this expansion of his uh, educational rights and health rights. And of course, there's great decoupling there as you expand this ideology in a very unequal world. Uh, some things actually happen, educational expansion actually happens. Other things uh, like the decline in the use of torture or something like that, um, it's more ambiguous whether uh, that happens, but everyone signs on uh, to to the, the, the treaties involved. The, wor the worst countries in the world signed human rights treaties. They, under they pay their hypocritical respects to the, to the pieties of the global liberal order. Well, the second poll, which I, I haven't timed, I don't want to waste time, Everyone has always said over and over again that there are more scientists alive now than there were in the entire prehistory of the human race. They say that and have been saying that since Price or something uh, decades ago. I don't know if it's still true, but for a long time it was true. And it's interesting, as with the expansion of the individual, how poor the so sociological explanations of that are a worldwide expansion of human rights, a worldwide expansion of science activity and the authority of science. The expansion, I mean, you can't very well give functional explanations uh, because that expansion, uh, it, it occurs very dramatically in the social sciences, which expand even more rapidly. If you count professorships, they expand more rapidly than, uh, than uh, natural scientists. Uh, and it is very hard to argue that fields like anthropology or sociology are somehow functional. Uh, I wouldn't want to accuse anyone in this room, this virtual space of contributing to the American GDP. Uh, but in any case, I, I need to skip over it, but the, extra, the expansion worldwide of scientific activity if you think of that from the point of view of constructing a liberalism, uh, in order for human action to make sense in a coordinated sense, it has to occur in a, a, against a more fixed reality. You can construct liberal models of markets where, where it's a market in nothing or nothing visible or anything. But the natural legitimator involves some sort of scientized picture of the world as a coherent, and lawful enterprise. They're talking about the social sciences, even within the social sciences. Here's data from Gabler and uh, Frank. Uh, the from a whole mess of universities around the world, uh, the percentage, it's a simple percentage, faculty and history as a percentage of social science faculty. And you see uh, how strikingly the uh, the, the, our, the perception of the social world is rationalized, not just the natural world. Uh, and much of this is imaginary, of course, but it provides a kind of legitimating basis for uh, uh, empowered individuals to engage in some sort of collective action. Another chart that shows the same things. This is from Drury and Moon. And here, the, the rising line is the social science. These are enrollments as a proportion of rapidly expanding world enrollments. Uh, 
this is uh, the decline of the humanities in uh, the, the reddish line and the rise of the social sciences in the blue line. Uh, uh, much of the social science expansion incidentally occurs in what David Frank calls the socio-sciences, meaning the sciences of human action, engineering, uh, business, education, public policy, law, and so on. Uh, and as you know, more, more and more sociologists are employed in such places uh, rather than in uh, sociology departments. Well, I need to move on. Uh, the third pillar, so I've talked about the rise of the individual, which empowered in, in the Christian tradition with the direct pipeline to God, and then um, occurring in a organized world so that proper action matters, especially after the Reformation, uh, and the scientized world. And the third is uh, the notion of purpose, uh, rationality. The world, the scientized world permits rational action. The empowered human is capable of it and we organize it. And that produces uh, the third pillar I want to talk about, the new neo-institutionalists look at, is the word. and that is uh, organization. Work, uh, work in a scientized world, empowered people assemble and around articulate, rationalized purpose. And you have just incredible expansions of organization. Patricia Bromley and I have a book about it uh, called Hyper Organization because many things that are unorganizable get organized, uh, often involving the author imagined authority of professionals. This cuts across countries, institutional sectors, so that it's not just your local uh, uh, evil capitalist making a, uh, get, make, creating organization. The local Methodist church is now much more of an organization. And God help us, the university, the Cornell. I mean, I, I assume that professors at Cornell talk about and only about it when they have lunch the offenses being produced by administrative expansion. And if you studied at Cornell, the expanded population over the last 50 years of students, yeah, it's there. Professors, yeah, it's there. But the big one is administrative staff, everywhere. That ex and that goes on in every sector, including baseball or, or business, or politics, or go government agencies, and so on. Become organizations, older forms become organizations. Uh, I have the data I have, I just, to, to, to illustrate this, I take from, I don't know, some things we did earlier. Um, the world uh, participation in, uh, uh, I can't read the heading, but it's, I, I think it's world participation in, in uh, some kind of organization. Oh dear, I don't know how to get rid of the, the screen, oh, there we go. This will help. No, this is just university students who are the basic material that goes into organizations. I just wanted to show that and to show you also uh, that this occurs in every region of the world, the expansion of university enrollments. As I'll, I'll mention in a minute, there may be cutbacks now. And then this famous old slide that everybody uses of, uh, uh, just the American occupational structure since 1910. The top line are professionals, that's us. The people who don't do anything, service, clerical, managers. And down at the bottom are the declines and the people who do something. Uh, and it's sort of very striking. The, you know, the expansion of a whole imagined world of rationalized organization. Here's go at the world level, non-governmental, international non-governmental organizations. And you see again, cutting point around 1950 and this explosion. Before that, they were rare. Now they're, they're, they're everywhere. 
And if we just went around this non-room that we're in, we would find hundreds of mem memberships, direct and indirect. Because if you belong to the American Sociological Association, you're by definition implicated in the World Sociological Association. That sort of thing. Non-governmental organization expands. Intergovernmental organization expands. That's this one. Same, the same curve, basically. But there are many fewer of them because there are only so many limited number of states in the world. And then the capitalists organize also. And until the modern period, it was understood that multinational organizations, real multinationals, were a dangerous thing. There was too much cultural conflict and variation. And business schools would have courses on how difficult it is to create a multinational. But now in the modern world, they're all world citizens. They've all been to Wharton. They've all got to know each other. And uh, it's an explosion. This count runs to 63,000 as of 2000. Other counts, uh, 80,000. Amazing. Well, so those are my three pillars uh, that I think the liberal society and then the shift to neoliberalism globalizes all this, as we've seen organization and so on, and weakens, I, I guess, the charisma of the national state. Well, obviously, all this comes in a, a, to a, a slowdown around the 2012 uh, in which the liberal world order gets challenged. Uh, it always was challenged in practice, but uh, you couldn't make a, a speech, say, against democracy very well in the world. Even in communist countries, you had to sort of talk democracy. Well, if starting in 2012, you can attack world markets, you can attack democracy, you can attack human rights. Uh, uh, so in other words, uh, you, you have uh, the liberal world order continues and uh, there continue to be expansions on the dimensions I've showed you, but it, it, it uh, there now is kickback and it's organized at the world level, not only at national levels. So explanations in terms of national characteristics don't work very well. Uh, there are various arguments about where the breakdown comes from. Some simply say the hyper the neoliberal system was overreach. Some would say the exemplar of the United States made mistake after mistake, and in any case lost standing in the world economically. Other people often refer to the recession around 2008. In all these cases, I think you're talking about the decline in imagined authority, not only in realistic consequences. So the, the, the delegitimation around 2008 occurs in the policies of, of countries where the people suffer and in countries where they don't, but see the failure. And similarly with other dimensions. So now anyone in, in our group here could, uh, write a, a, a paper stigmatizing democracy or human rights or obviously science. So there's worldwide movements that are, that are critical of science, as you know. Um, Wade Cole at Utah has papers on anti-vaccination which is just one concrete example. But there are many other examples also. Of the, the weakening of criticism of the authority of science, which continues to expand, but the criticisms now get organized at the world level. At the human rights level, lots of criticism also. Many of them centered on the, uh, the fact that the liberal system, which had a long history of uh, economic life and political life in the rise of the modern state and the rise of the modern economy. The more recent attacks and expansions of liberalism have been in attacks on the family, the liberation of each individual member of a family, and the reconstruction of them as an individual or her with rights of divorce, rights of abortion, 
uh, economic rights, marital rape attacks, rights of children, rights of old people, all kinds of, uh, of things. Uh, and you get kickback on that. Oh, and gays and lesbians and all the sexual stuff. So that now when you do a questionnaire, I saw one from Harvard, that on the question asking whether you're, you know, you're, you're, uh, are you male or female? They had to create like 17 categories, which is each one of which an individual can choose to occupy. And most of which involve dramatically being an individual. Uh, the person who studies this most most recently and most effectively, uh, Elizabeth Boyle had written papers earlier on this as a worldwide phenomena. Uh, the person who uh, studies it uh, most successfully right now is Chris Christopher Velasco at Princeton with a dissertation at Texas and a, papers in the ASR and the AJS. And he focuses especially on gay rights. And he shows pretty clearly that in this case, around a node in world order, the Catholic Church, then you get, a, it's a node around which pro-family people, pro-traditional family people can assemble, ideas can assemble. And he studies that as a worldwide process. Uh, it's obviously linked to the free modern choice that people have of their gender, their sexuality, and so on. So there comes under a lot of attack. Uh, it also is an attack on organization. And I'll just show you one slide. This is from Patricia Bromley and collaborators, uh, uh, restrictions on foreign funding to non-governmental organizations, which expand as we speak. That she, she, her data set ended in 2016, but it continues over time. And there are more and more constraints. So sort of the free world of free people in free association uh, comes under attack from a nationalist point of view as uh, uh, pretty dramatically. Um, and there are other people uh, studying the, uh, the same thing. The problem for world society researchers in studying this is that there's not one coherent anti-liberal post or post-liberal synthesis. Some of them root themselves in a nationalism, an anti-state nationalism. Others in religious solidarities. Others in ethnic, and some there's some racism now, uh, uh, attempting to find, and, and some is just localisms, but it, it, they, there's, they're not all together. The Catholic Church and its hostility to the individualist family is not in close alliance with Mr. Putin and his kind of religious nationalism. So that the one thing you can study is that they all have in common an opposition to uh, the liberal and especially the uh, extreme liberal uh, order, uh, which they stigmatize as Western, American, Christian, European. And now, especially in, 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 in sociology, I think we're, they somehow bring back the word colonial to stigmatize essentially all of modernity as a, a, a colonial imposition. Uh, and so uh, that's a sort of striking change and it's very strong in sociology not only in America, but also it comes up a lot in Europe, usually a left-wing storyline. But it is very odd to see American sociology students uh, uh, stigmatizing so much. Uh, and I have rarely in my life heard people so passionately argue for their own unemployment. Um, it, 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 it's... Uh, it's amazing. But if we go to the convention, you will find the word colonial appearing. It wasn't there 12, 15 years ago. There were criticisms of the world order as economically unequal. But this is a broader anti-modern or anti-liberal story. And it's just very interesting to study. It's a little unpleasant to live with, but it's very 
um, a striking thing to study. Uh, and I think a number of researchers really are, this is what World Society researchers focus on and talk about right now in the last five years or so, how to, how to get at that, how to find various nodes in world society of a post-liberal. Oh, and I should have mentioned uh, the post-liberalism uh, in Clifford. Bob makes this point very, very strikingly. Often take, it's not simply a regression to some imagined pre-world. It takes off from some of the assumptions of the liberal order and, and breaks them loose from the liberal synthesis. And uh, so it, it, it takes off. So a great many of the most aggressive liberals in the world, now freed from organiz the, the organizational structures of, and legitimation and from scientism, argue for their illiberal points of view on liberal pretenses. I am entitled to my opinion on vaccination. And I am entitled to turn that into action even if it kills everybody with measles. Uh, there is uh, uh, an expanded individualism using the, the liberal, the individualist pretenses of liberalism in this explosive way, uncontrolled. And you get similar scientisms broken loose uh, as uh, a perverted scientific doctrine. That's always been there, but it's much stronger. And then you get a whole lot of attacks on ra rational organization uh, and assertion uh, of, of uh, uh, the importance of rights, importance of community, the importance of feeling, and all that kind of thing. A reconstruction of the imagined organization on post-organizational terms. Uh, so the, all that is not simply regressive, all that is. Well, that covers what I wanted to um, to talk about, and let me stop there. And uh, perhaps I can suppress the slideshow and, and uh, open it up for any discussion you want to put. Thank you, John. Um, and so, what we will do is to uh, have people use Zoom to raise your hand, and I'll call on you, and um, you can pose your question, or you can engage John in a discussion or debate. Uh, so far it's quiet. Am I missing? Uh, Well, John, why don't I start with a question? Um, in the background of your writing on the liberal world order uh, is the earlier modernization theory, which provided a alternative framework for um, development of the world to Marxism. And to what extent is the rise of the liberal order that you discussed this afternoon linked to American power and the rise of American power uh, and in the world order and establishing uh, a liberal order uh, and institutions that would realize and support a liberal order in American idea of it? Uh, and to what extent is the recent criticism that you po point to a reflection of a this decline perhaps of American power uh, or the cohesive strength of a vision for the new world that was there right after World War II and in the early 50s. I think that's central, but I would add to the word power uh, to some notion of legitimacy and so on. Yes, is, of course, legitimacy. That is, uh, I'd use the word power in a European sense, not the vulgar American yeah, sense. Sure. Uh, okay. And, but but certainly both, both your stories are, are, are I think, 
Right. Almost everybody who thinks about it thinks that the post-World War II order, world order, did reflect the American hegemony, meaning uh, legitimacy and, uh, and, and power. Yes. Uh, a, a good book on that was Marie Lord Jellick's Harvard dissertation, which turned into a book on the Marshall Plan as a, a vision, not of American economic gains, but of a kind of a liberal vision of a world order. But there are many other studies like that that captured. And then I think you're also right in saying uh, that the breakdown in 2012, the Americans had done some really uh, offensive things in Vietnam, you know, invading various places. And it came to seem not as enforcing a liberal world order, but as a colonial enterprise and the, the, the criticisms. So I think you're absolutely right on both counts. Just replace, I, I try to avoid the word power in, on this side of the Atlantic because of uh, uh, it, 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 I don't think it captures it. But certainly, when I did uh, uh, consulting work on education projects in uh, Southern Africa, I was treated as uh, a representative of educational science from the high, high centers of the world. Well, only a few people, namely people attack old Brit types, socialist Brit types, would see me as an American intruder. Everybody else thought I was a scientist. Now I think you'd get more uh, kickback in the local uh, ministers of education. Learn to question, am I simply reflecting American dominance? Right. Well, uh, there's a book I do, uh, which was written maybe two, decade, two decades ago by Franz Schurman. Uh, okay. And he conceived it of the liberal order, not simply as as you point out, power, but also the ideas and progressive idealism of American post-war order uh, that was embedded in institutions like the World Bank and IMF, but and the United Nations, which pushed very advanced the idea of human rights. But it was not, it was different from the European colonial power because it didn't seek to occupy and govern people through colonial administrations, but it yeah. was a progressive idealism about how a world order could be organized and sustained for the benefit, as you point out, of advancing the cause of human rights. Is 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 that fair to say that there was a different ethos which uh, think, the colonialism of the Europeans. Yes, I think that's just what you just said is just fundamental. Yeah, it was seen as a, a, a vision of a more democratic world and a more individual world and a more rational world. Uh, yeah, more organized because also Americans exported organization, you know, in the in the modern sense, I agree. And it was seen as ideal and they didn't, only they start to call it neo-imperial in 68, when the student radicals protesting the Vietnam business start to talk more aggressively about American neo-imperialism, you know, and, and world capitalism. But as you said, just as you said, that, that word didn't come up in describing the Americans. The Americans were weakly anti-colonial. Right. Yeah, and we're seen as a, a ideal. Part of it is a legitimacy thing. I, I agree with what you said. Just friend. Yeah. Well, let's open the uh, space for others. Paul, you're there, and David, and Brett, I see, and Sway, and many others. Uh, not only the Cornell community, but a broader community of the Center for the Study of Economy and Society, it seems, and students. So how... Are we, do we have a question or a point? Oh, David? Uh, you have to be unmuted. 
Paul, Paul DiMaggio has his hand up. Okay, De Paul. Um, you're still muted, Paul. Uh, unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, in the new post-liberal um, world, do you see an emerging um, new variant on the image of the actor that you talked about that um, emerged in this period of, of liberalism? Is there a new constitution of what it means to be a person that varies from the, the one that we've been living with? I think it's a great question. I don't think there's much consolidation there mm -hmm. uh, around that. But there is certainly a weaker sense of, of actorhood. Mm -hmm. So you have the resurgence of not just racism, but also the genetic talk, mm -hmm. you know, where people inquire into their ancestry and they inquire into their, their genetic bases. And, uh, uh, and then some some guy in the Stanford Medical School just has a book who's sort of attacking free will. A mm -hmm. professor, met, I don't know if you may have seen a review, uh, mm -hmm. where he he studies some things in the brain and sees some causal structure there, and he decides, oh, it's all determined. Mm -hmm. So he makes a book. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Yeah. But I don't think that's consolidated. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I it seems like you can go in, in different ways. Um, yes, Right, if you look at, I mean, the other thing that's been going on with genetics is the understanding that the environment actually turns genes on and off, which leads to, in some ways, a less determinist. Theory. Right. Yeah. yeah. And from a research point of view, that's exciting. Those are the interaction effects that I was talking yeah. about. That, are, yeah. that if you get away from uh, the classifications that we have lived with, you get interesting stuff like that. Yeah. And it could go a lot of different ways. Yeah. Uh, and I think it does go. Of course, if for empirical research, you try to find examples like Cole's work on vaccination. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, all kind of weird stuff on child rearing. You even get right wing stuff. There are a few jurisdictions that now revert and permit uh, spanking children. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, corporate, corporal punishment a district in Texas, a district in Florida, a country in Africa somewhere. But it's mm -hmm. that's pretty weak stuff. I don't think that's yet happened. Mm -hmm. where, where, uh, but there are candidates for office who argue that they beat their children mm -hmm. th th this in the South. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know where it goes, but it's a great question. Thank you. Then I, I, I think uh, the validation of opinion independent of fact is really striking that you you can if you tell me a fact I can say well that's your reality <laughs> <laughs> that's tough you know? yeah. and it's partly empowered to do that mm -hmm. it's also a period in which you get a lot of extreme science fiction stuff mm -hmm. there was a paper in the AJS years ago that in the 1890s you got that kind of thing the present period has something in common with the pre-world war period Mm -hmm. And with the interwar period in the, the 30s, there mm -hmm. are a lot of analogs there, but I don't see a. Do you see a, a consolidated uh, world? Uh, no, I, I think it's. No. Yeah. I wonder if you need a hegemon in order to have consolidation. I wonder too, yeah. And you, one of the problems with China. Uh, is that it doesn't represent a copyable model mm -hmm. in the same way that the Soviet Union did or that Japan in the 1980s did. Mm -hmm. We had a real picture, and at Stanford you had professors teaching that we should do things the Japanese way. Mm -hmm. In 1992 they shut up. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and in fact, I, I have not seen a Stanford professor burn his own book, but it comes close to that. Of course, in Germany, they had other people do it for him. <laughs> and I guess, um, yeah. Then there were even celebrations of Maoist China at Stanford. Um, I suppose elsewhere, too. You know, that, that 
radical reconstruction was a wave of the future. But uh, it's hard to use the United States. And, and, and it was not so long ago that you could use the American example as a positive example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David, you had a question. Go ahead, David. Sure. Um, I guess, so, so it seems like all these, uh, some of the things you've touched on, uh, you do have strong oppositions, I, I would say. I mean, say, if it, which can be read in multiple ways. So vaccination, for instance, on the one hand, you could say, okay, that's a, a sort of possible anti-science. From a different point of view, it's a kind of democratization of medical action, of, you know, where, where each person can can be a, a kind of researcher or observer of of regularities or events and so on. Similarly, you can have a an argument over a kind of model of people as infinitely flexible choosers who can who can select sexual identities um, or change their bodies in ways that that are not connected, you know, to a uh, which would seem novel. And on the other side of that are is a possible, a more genetic, you know, kind of analysis of what it means to be a, a a human being, or even maybe an actor as well. So, so I guess what maybe so it, it just seems that you you have a variety of of active oppositions, which which at least in part can always be read in terms of of these underlying uh, models that you describe. I mean, a lot of things can be interpreted as as um, uh, at some level supporting a, somebody's actorhood or a principle of actorhood, but in quite different ways. And and I guess I, what I wonder is is for, from your point of view, you know what what is what is so a lot of things might be sort of seemingly family or cultural debates, you know, which which are quasi loosely tied to some common frame. Um, and I guess I'm wondering what is really out of bounds in this way of picturing a common culture. What what really challenges? I mean, you know, I mean, you're suggesting that there are some um, there, there's some elements that 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 uh, are, are are that is less homogeneous today than it was ten years ago or twenty years ago or so on. But but what's really out of bounds? Is, but is at the same time a real possibility? That would tell us that a different culture is is developing. Well, I think what you said is you're exactly right, and the answer is I, I don't understand what the next synthesis, if if there is, what it will look like. And as you know, it's all over the map. But on the specific points you mentioned, I think you're exactly right. The anti-vaccination movement takes off from uh, people who are empowered to make their own medical diagnoses and uh, uh, and they can sometimes do so on scientific grounds. They create an alternative scientific justification or a non-scientific, you know, uh, on some other uh, religious basis or something. Uh, so it's it's unclear, but a lot of the anti-vaccination things, and of course you experience it in America when you go to the doctor. I don't know about Cornell, just, uh, but in this area, you know, the doctor asks your opinion on a lot of questions that they didn't ask your opinion on. You're making the decision. I find it comforting because I've spent time in Germany and Austria in which the doctors are still doctors. And uh, they... Uh, they uh, exercise authority and uh, tell you what to do uh, and don't consult with you about your own opinion. Um, and I, I find it uh, comforting. I've seen an Austrian doctor handle, you know, within an hour, 12, 14 patients because he doesn't have to listen to them. He, he, he just sees what makes some kind of quick diagnosis, a prescription, and out the door. Um, I find that comforting, but uh, it would be a violation in Palo Alto Medical Foundation. So uh, Anne Soy has a question, and, uh, and Anne? Thank you, Victor. 
Um, I don't really have a question I, or a comment. I don't think I'm qualified to ask a question or to make a comment. Um, I, I'm here like a graduate student, even though I'm a medical faculty from Arizona State University, um, because I'm a psychologist. I was trained in psychology and worked in a business school in the management area. But if I had to do it all over again, I would study sociology. I'm a real fan of sociology, and you are all giants in the field that I feel privileged today to listen to. Um, and uh, it's, it's Paul DeMarcio is here, Woody Powell is here. I've met Woody in China at one of the conferences. So, so what I want to express is my gratitude to all the great writings uh, that you've done, you all have done, and I've learned from so much that made me admire the work of sociology so much. And I was delighted to see some of the variables mentioned today, uh, one of which that caught my eyes is the word stress, uh, stress at work, and especially the term uh, therapy dog. Uh, I don't need, want to make light of the serious <laughs> conversation we have here, but I'm a therapy dog mom. My dog and I are a team. We go to hospitals, we go to nursing homes, we go to um, community colleges, the libraries, and it's a real, real um, a contribution to the to the world in, in to some people in a sense. But just to um, to uh, conclude my comments, I, I really am very grateful to to uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, learning about uh, your insights on what's happening. Uh, uh, for the mind, what's happening in the world in the last 50 years. I would have liked to hear a little bit about what are your take on what's happening in China, because that's where I did most of my work in recent years. Uh, your colleague, Xu Guangzhou, is a friend of mine, and I'm a friend of um, uh, Yan Jiban, as well as Jupiter Askowitz, so I have many sociology friends, and, and so uh, uh, most of them have a great China interest, like Victor. So if you have some insights, perspectives, thoughts about the development in China, uh, either from a sociological uh, discipline perspective or other areas, I would love to hear that. So that's my end. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for, for, for mm -hmm. your comment. Yeah, I, uh, uh, on, on two, uh, let me make two responses. On therapy dogs, I understand their <laughs> use in, in therapeutic situations. It just was very startling for me to realize that the university is obliged to treat student stress at exam time as a social problem. Um, and this is involved a change. Uh, well, I thought that was inherent. And as the guy who sent it to me from the University of Utah, uh, he sent he, he sent me this. Uh, and he, he attached it. When he was young, it was different that we solved the problem with vodka and cigarettes. Uh, he, he said, ah. Oh. And but now there's this elaborate. Okay. Well, your second point here about China, uh, uh, Victor uh, talked about it initially, uh, the, the resolute commitment of, in China to create a universities, research universities by world standards. And I keep asking Shi Guangzhou, who, uh, who knows a lot more about it, and other friends from China, isn't there any kickback? Isn't there any attempt to say, no, we, we, we have a different knowledge base. And they say, no, they're mainly the effort is to, in the sciences especially, just win in the world competition. And the only place where they allow, where they kind of do real traditional Chinese stuff, he said, is in with low status and marginal schools that say, you know, teach Chinese stuff. But it's not... Uh, yet part of a stratification system or an attempt to form an alternative model. But my own theory would say of after this 2012 breakdown that the, the Chinese criticism ought to create a, a decline in resort to universe, university rankings worldwide, uh, including their own. Uh, and uh, but I, people, I haven't found much yet. I keep thinking it ought to happen. Uh, theoretically, uh, but I don't. I don't have data that it is happening there. But I think Victor or you might know much more detail if the ways a professor can be in trouble 
for not being Chinese enough. You know, I just, Victor might have a comment on that. I, I don't know. Well, it is a curious question because the I've not, I've recently visited China in December 2023 and was struck very much in giving a lecture in at the Chinese University of Hong Kong in Shenzhen, how much they had adopted and been shaped by the influence of the American liberal university. Uh, this is a university, the scale of Cornell University. It's new, 12, 10 years old, 12 years old. Instruction is entirely in English. Uh, on the billboards, uh, of the student graduating class, the young men looked like they were preparing for business school careers, and the young women, had, many of them had were bleached blondes. So I, I was very much struck by the strong influence, not only of Hong Kong, but the traditions of liberal university in the United States, because they were hiring their new assistant professors from the best universities of the United States, paying them comparable salary and giving working out deals that would have made Stanford blush okay. to get to stars. Uh, so, so, and, and again, in the economy, I was struck by how much they, how many of the people I interviewed and met were got their PhDs at UCLA, at Harvard, at MIT. And starting, they were starting up uh, private startup firms uh, that they hoped to be unicorns. In the same sense as in the American startup in Silicon Valley or New York, uh, and there was a tremendous neoliberal atmosphere there for pursuit of profit. Uh, Shenzhen now has the largest population of billionaires in the world, uh, the American dollar billionaires, they're not as rich as the billionaires in the Silicon Valley. There, there you have the mo concentration of the richest billionaires, but they are clearly moving as quickly as they can to uh, build a free enterprise economy with the state involved in supporting this, which is, Again, one of the reasons I thought your talk really followed this uh, identified uh, a world order that most of us would not have anticipated so well developed in the country led by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, that is the paradox. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think it, you can find that elsewhere. The, the, the celebration of the neoliberal world also is strong in the Persian Gulf, where it's very disconnected from actual Persian Gulf realities. They, the Persian Gulf countries uh, create education programs in entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. They're... And I keep thinking that the, the changes we talked about in the last 10 years ought to produce some stigmatization of entrepreneurship. And uh, I think I would expect people to stop talking about Steve Jobs and start talking about Elizabeth Holmes because <laughs> the entrepreneur is, uh, is in an older language is not an admirable figure. He is probably foreign, uh, different ethnicity and exploited. But now he's the, it remains uh, and Stanford. But I do think that Stanford, I don't know about Cornell, but Stanford's celebration of the of the, the radical neoliberal entrepreneurship idea, I think it is weaker now. Uh -huh. And it may be Elizabeth Holmes has something to do with that. Uh, uh, right, right. Uh, it's hard to say. Cornell is playing catch up with Stanford uh, with their tech campus, so our tech campus in New York City. But again, the it's very clear that American young people have doubts about the future of capitalism. Yes, are inclined to think that socialism will pro provide a brighter future. But mm -hmm. what's striking in the young people in China that uh, live in Shanghai or especially Shenzhen is how uncritical they are of the future of capitalism. Yes. 
neoliberal sense of yeah. So what, that, I think that all that stuff goes on that older pattern against the wave of critical alternatives. It's just not clear to me where it comes out. But the people who thought that the anti uh, or post liberal criticism were just a short uh, binge, that's clearly wrong. It, it it does get entrenched in various policies about the family, about sexuality, and I think about economic stuff. That is, if David, uh, I mean, my collaborator uh, Evan Schofer has data just on the decline of bi bilateral investment treaties which were at one time an assertion of we're all part of a big world and they disappear. Um, uh, 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 and I think it would be a faith, uh, a big problem to be a politician in a third world country and talk about doing things the American way or talking capitalism. Uh, but as you say, there are corners of the world in which it's still magical. Yes. I don't know where it goes. Well, we have uh, passed our time of 545. It's now 550. And so we should thank you very much. And I do thank you so much, John, to see you. And thank you so much for presenting this amazingly deep and thoughtful, uh, oh, comprehensive account of the world of the liberal society of and world society that you've led the writing on uh, yeah. going back to your early writing in the 1970s uh, and the book that you edited with Michael Hannon yes uh, also part of that move yeah I guess uh you find uh, in study yeah we having studied spent so much time studying the great binge of liberalism and neoliberalism it's quite exciting although it's quite depressing also to, to see many of the attacks. I mean, it is, uh, but it's very exciting as a research. Uh, it provides variance that we didn't know was there. <laughs> and that, that's, that makes it just a lot of fun. You go home at night and you think the world might come to an end, but the idea is at least we have a good analysis of why it happened. If we, if and, we, uh, we heard from Chris, my colleague, Christopher Young, that John Meyer is the person who the graduate students still search for and seek out to talk about their ideas. And you are still a major force of intellectual influence and training at Stanford. And so I can see the energy uh, already in today's talk. And I should add that there will be a sequel in the fall. John will give a follow-up talk from the comforts of Stafford in his home uh, in the fall. Uh, and I don't know what precisely it will be about. We'll wait until the inspiration hits well, you. We talked about organization theory and uh, on which I work. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thanks, Victor.